our first keynote speaker, Andrew Sullivan, who for several decades has been bringing his academic training in political philosophy to bear upon current policy issues and controversies in American life. Uh, Andrew and our conference team had planned on having him here in person, uh, but with the Omicron wave uh, continuing, he's going to be joining us via Zoom this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Dr. Andrew Sullivan is a columnist and a blogger at The Weekly Dish, a popular source of provocative political and social commentary for two decades and more in American life. The New York Times has referred to Sullivan as the most influential political writer of his generation. From 2000 to 2015, Sullivan chronicled every major political and cultural moment in real time on his blog, The Dish. And prior to that, uh, and which, which was uh, featured on uh, Time Magazine and The Atlantic and then was, uh, it was so well known it was just independently uh, The Daily Dish. For his work at The New Republic as the youngest editor-in-chief, Sullivan was named Editor of the Year by Adweek and received multiple national magazine awards. After working at Time and for The New York Times Magazine, he served as a senior editor for The Atlantic. He was a leader of the gay rights movement and advocating for gay marriage, wrote two books on that topic in 1995, Virtually Normal, an argument about homosexuality, and in 1989, Here Comes the Groom, a conservative case for gay marriage. I'll just add in relation to our school, Andrew earned his PhD in political science at Harvard University, focusing on political philosophy. One of his mentors there was Harvey Mansfield, and Mansfield served on the founding academic advisory board for our school and drafted our founding mission statement. I'll have to ask Andrew if he's read that. So uh, we'll have three parts uh, to this session. Andrew will speak, and then I will pop back up on stage and pose some questions to him. And then, as I mentioned, we'll have about 20 minutes at the end of the session for Q&A from the audience. For his keynote address on We All Live on Campus Now, please join me in welcoming Andrew Sullivan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I suppose we ought to take a moment before I start to think of the people of Ukraine who are currently under a hideous and violent assault. It's a reminder that politics actually does matter, that getting things right in public life matters. And at this point in the middle of the confusion, I just, I just want to take a moment to think of those poor people at this, at this time. I also wanna thank you for inviting me to this. Uh, you're right, Harvey Mansfield was a huge influence on me. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he's, the way he conducted intellectual life, the curious, spirited, mischievous, constantly questioning, constantly ironic, Socratic method that he had is one of the things that has always stuck with me. For two years, every week for an hour, on Friday afternoons, I was privileged enough to sit with Harvey in a room and read The Republic. And we, after two years, we got roughly halfway through book seven. And it's in that spirit, and that view of what intellectual life really needs to be that I want to talk about today. We're living in a really strange moment. It is not without a precedent in America. America has often had what we might call moral panics. It is a country that without a recognized and formal government religion has encouraged and helped develop spontaneous religious forces that often seize society and often overwhelm more liberal and uh, enlightenment principles. I'm thinking of the Salem witch trials. I'm thinking of the Hollywood blacklist. I'm thinking of the know nothings. I'm thinking of the lavender scare. I'm thinking of the 90s where every person who ran a childcare center was suddenly deemed a pedophile until proven innocent. These panics spread 
and they can seize our public life and render free debate and honest, good faith intellectual inquiry a dead letter. My hope, which is that history also tells us that these panics do subside, that in the middle of them, it seems that they may be permanent, but then after a while, the falsity, the falsehood, the extremity and the passions decline somewhat. And that is my hope for where we are now. But underneath this, I want to debate and talk about two different aspects of this, two deeper arguments that are going on beneath the surface and sometimes not beneath the surface. And the first is the conflict, the constant conflict between the individual and the group. The individual, the creation of this idea of an individual is very rare in human history. It may possibly be understood to have only really emerged in the early modern period in Europe and then America. This notion that the core building block of a society is an individual's body and soul and conscience. And the coercion of this is the thing that we are most dedicated in politics to preventing. This is our building block for a liberal society. It does not mean that other attachments and groups are not incredibly important. We need community, we need family, we need nation. These things matter, but deep, deep down, the constitution recognizes us first and foremost as individual human beings with inalienable rights by virtue of our individualism. In contrast to this, for almost all of human history and for most of the world right now, the individual is a strange construct. Humans are group creatures. We're tribal. For the vast majority of our existence on planet Earth, we operated in very tight-knit groups, somewhere around 150 to 200. We shared everything together, including personal, private life. We were conditioned to act as a group, as a tribe, with respect to defending ourselves and providing meaning to ourselves. This is the natural state of being for humans. It's what comes easiest to us. We're a member of a group, a tribe, and we're opposed to those other groups and those other tribes. And this conflict is unending and eternal. And what matters is the status and importance of the group. And an individual that challenges that, that undermines it, that insists upon independence from it, is a threat. I think what we're seeing in America right now and in the West to some extent is the return of the natural state of being, tribes. It's not that this has not been happening in America. Obviously, racial tribalism has been defining in many ways of parts of this culture and this country. But individualism as an idea, as a goal, the notion that we can actually in some ways conceive of ourselves as independent from the group of people we are a part of is still essential. And when you create groups that are plainly visible by the color of your skin, by your sex, by your origin, if you can tell, then we deepen, deepen and double down on the sense of group identity. And so when you show up at a college today, the most important thing first to understand is where you fit in terms of the group. What group are you in? Are you in a group that is historically and contemporarily in a form, as a form of oppression? Or are you in a group 
that is actually part of the oppressed. We call this intersectionality because it's more complicated than that. And when you add every single conceivable group identity to every single individual, you have quite a complex situation. In fact, if you take intersectionality to its logical conclusion, you do end up with the individual in the end. I think of myself, am I actually a Catholic? Am I a homosexual? Am I a conservative? Am I intellectual? Or am I just a person? Am I just actually a human being who expresses himself at various times in various forms of identity? But there is a connective tissue that is unique and is me. And this connective tissue, this meanness, is what we seek in the West to protect. We seek to protect the individual conscience. We seek to protect the individual's right to believe the things he or she really believes in. And we see that individual's independence from the group as something to be valued. You go into a voting booth and it is private. It's your decision. And the human being <clears throat> cannot be reduced simply to things it identifies with. The power of group identity is undeniable. That's why it's spreading. The ease with which we want to identify other individuals as members of other groups is deep in our psyches. And even evolutionary biologists will tell you in our genes. So to go to a campus and immediately think of yourself not as an individual, but as a member of a white group or a black group or an Asian group or a queer group or a cisgender group or all the other forms of identities that you can find comes incredibly naturally to us. And what we find, of course, is that when we train individuals who come to campus to think of themselves as parts of groups, first and foremost, the consequence studies have shown is that we actually become more racist, more sexist, more attuned to our group differences. We can train ourselves to think of ourselves constantly in terms of tribal identity because it comes more easily. Against this, of course, uh, is a tradition of the individual which is rooted to some extent in Christianity and in the liberalism that emerged to tame Christianity. On the other side, you have simply the massive DNA of, uh, of our species and the lessons of group conflict that we have in the past. That is essentially one axis of conflict, the individual and the group. We all feel this conflict in ourselves, but increasingly it's becoming the defining conflict for our society. And these tribal groupings, especially when they're also related to race or even sex or sexual orientation, or even to some extent gender identity, whatever that means, uh, it's a dangerous force and it can swamp our minds and destroy our sense of ourselves. And somehow the challenge is to rescue the individual from this intellectual climate. The second polarity, it seems to me, is simply to put it bluntly, a distinction between truth and power. That's a very crude way of putting it, of course. But what I mean is two views of the world. One in which there is something called truth, which does exist, which is in some sense objective, and which is the reality we have to try and understand from the very limited and specific perspective of an individual human being. 
we may not be able to know that truth in any sure or certain way. But we accept the possibility of it because without it, we are completely lost. We can arrive at the sense of truth from religious revelation or through reason itself in an unending Socratic dialogue, which my own mentor Oakshot called the conversation of mankind. This is not an arrogant and confident and hubristic assertion that we know what the truth is. On the contrary, it's often shadows on a wall as a famous philosopher once described it. But it's there. We want to see it, it's what we guide ourselves by. And it exists independent of our will and our wishes and our projection and our insularity and particularity. The alternative view could be understood to be somewhat cynical, maybe realistic, and in some senses uh, true, of course, in, as well, which is that essentially all truth is an instrument of someone's power. That the reality we live in is something imposed actually by people we may not even know or recognize, but is because they have collective power over everyone else. And this power determines everything. So to inquire into truth has to take second place to first equalizing power. That means that it's much more important first and foremost for campuses to have the right social mix to equalize the power of various groups in society before any such discussion of what is true can exist at all. But of course, it becomes clearer and clearer once you enter this world that, in fact, if truth simply is a function of power, then the point is surely not to pursue truth, but to pursue power and to impose an orthodoxy, your truth, on everyone else. This is a really profound conflict. It really is at the root of Western civilization's struggle. Just as the distinction between truth and power is central, so the distinction between the individual and the group is central. What I believe is that the defense of the individual, the construction of a society around the freedom of that individual, independent of these group identities, has been one of the most extraordinary, wonderful, and productive experiments in human history. It is not without its flaws and its faults, but compared with the opposite, it seems to me to be much preferable. The idea right now that Ukraine can be a place where ideas are freely exchanged, where democracy is a balancing of different interests, where individual rights are actually protected, contrasted with the power that determines everything in an authoritarian state like Russia, and that will soon enforce its truth by force. That's the conflict, and it's a conflict internationally, but it's also a conflict among ourselves. And it's not just a conflict, although right now the left is so dominant in our culture and institutions, it's also a tendency on the right. Instead of constantly returning to the necessity for debate and argument, the right too can be tempted to impose an orthodoxy, a rigid orthodoxy, and prevent discussion, debate, and evolution of ideas. Now it seems, I think, to you and to many of us that the individual and truth are right now losing a battle with groups and power. What 
things can we do to defend the first notion, the liberal notion? And I think a couple of things. First of all, appeal to people in the West who value individualism. Celebrate the individual character. Celebrate the personality. Celebrate the skills of the human being that transcend anything to do with his or her origins or sex. America is an absolute festival of the achievements of these individuals and the great joy and interest and advancement of knowledge that these individuals have created. America still believes in that individual character. It should be possible to celebrate it more gleefully, more joyfully, and emphasize it always when we're being confronted with arguments about group identity. Secondly, I think we can appeal, I hope, to the rebelliousness of youth. One of the striking things about today's generation is how unrebellious they are. How, in fact, they seek to echo, even police, their own teachers in the philosophies that they have been indoctrinated in. I've never been on campus in my adult lifetime and seen students so supine in the face of authority, so unified. Students allying with authorities to persecute other students. Now this is, again, a really ugly and I feel worrying development, but I also believe human nature has not been abolished. And I also believe that orthodoxies at some point, sooner or later, will provoke a response. And at some point, sooner or later, the young will seek to distinguish themselves from their elders. In this mockery, argument, ridicule, humor, and the exposure of extremism and cruelty, are all instruments that we can use and are using to turn the cultural tide. The last thought I want to leave with you, and I hope we can subsequently discuss this, is a deeper question. Is the very concept of individualism something that is so bound up in a Christian and then post-Christian Europe that the collapse of Christianity as a public religion, the sustainer of this kind of thought, the deeper metaphysical underpinnings of the notion of the individual's inviolable sacredness, of the individual's uniqueness, of the individual's soul. If we leave that deep metaphysical past behind us, and I know I'm just kind of regurgitating Nietzsche at this point, but bear with me. Can we sustain the system that was built on that foundation? We will see. If we can't, then a civic religion of individualism, democracy, and freedom is, is the only recourse we have. The question is, will it have the psychological, spiritual strength and vibrancy of the power of tribal identity, tribal resentment, tribal ressentiment, as it, as it were? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know really what the full consequences of the collapse of Christianity in the West are going to be, although I do not think they will be little or nothing. And so we stand in a way at a crossroads where I return to some basic thoughts. The West has been an extraordinary exception to the rule of human experience on earth. The West has created things that humans never previously did. It has also generated great problems, of course, but the West also has the resources, I think, to resolve those problems through 
open and free inquiry and understanding. We can be proud of this. We don't have to apologize for it. We don't have to defend it from every charge because liberal societies have in the past clearly tolerated forms of discrimination and oppression against groups. But our response is to say that discrimination against groups was wrong, profoundly wrong, because it violated the rights of the individuals in that group. Because it forced them to identify as the group and not as the person. In other words, the very arguments that brought us the Civil Rights Act, that what matters is not what the, the color of the skin, but what someone can do as an individual and the rights that person has, regardless of the color of their skin. That's the spirit. It's a great liberal tradition. It used to unite parts of the right and left. It is now in an eclipse. But eclipses do not last forever. And my hope is that with conferences and ideas and arguments like this, we can at some point begin to bring it back. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we have, you and I have about um, 15 minutes for a conversation. Um, there are people eavesdropping. Um, but, so I wanted to start, thank you for those remarks. I wanted to start with um, a question about a f fundamental paradox of the modern liberal achievement, which you just very eloquently uh, described and defended. The paradox, you know, having waived that pocket constitution that we have earlier, the, the paradox that uh, at the root of the American version of this, which draws on the British heritage, is, is we hold these truths. There are truths. And the, they shape a particular legal constitutional order. And yet we insist that part of the truth is, is the freedom to debate, discuss, dissent from uh, those truths. So could you talk a little bit about why that's not, um, you know, an, an utter contradiction, but is it a tension or a, a paradox that we, we need to grapple with and, and teach ourselves about? Uh, um, but but it's, it's a paradox tension in a healthy way, not a, not a self-contradiction failure. Yeah, I do. Well, of course, the, the, the word attached to that truth is self-evident, which is an extremely limited claim. Uh, it, it's kind of actually going out of its way to deny that we somehow know by virtue of our genius and brilliance that this is true and no one else does. The conception is that this is self-evident. Uh, and it, that, of course, is a truth claim, but it's a kind of modest truth claim in a way. I think the tension is resolved. I mean, some people put the tension as between sort of truth and nihilism, either, you, either it's there or it's not. And what that misses, I think, is a third option, which is skepticism, which is that truth up to a point, truth with the part of ourselves that recognizes that we are humans and therefore could well be in error. And that's the other part of individualism, which is important. It is built into the Christian notion that individuals can also be wrong and that we can delude ourselves and that we need to constantly keep open the possibility of our being wrong. But that does not mean we have to live in a world in which nothing is ever true and nothing can be said that can be true. We, uh, or as Oakshaw put it, everything is true so long as it isn't taken to be anything more than it is. Uh, and I think that skeptical, Socratic, Oakshatian understanding of what truth is without knowing the content of that truth is, is in fact, uh, a healthy and productive paradox. In, in relation to that, you know, the, the Declaration makes four references to a divinity. You brought up the... the 
the particular religion of Christianity, but that that moment of the Enlightenment in the 18th century, may, maybe uh, arguably drawing on on uh, some medieval view that there could be both Aristotle science and and uh, biblical belief, uh, but that that seems to be. Um, forgotten in our understanding of the American founding, that there's both a philosophical interest and argument in, in understanding self-evident truths, uh, bedrock that seem to be in the frame of nature from a, from a divine mind or a divine source, as well as a particular religious uh, uh, belief or uh, commitment. So is it do, is it is it how, how do we how do we reintroduce <laughs> that view that it's both both philosophy, even science and uh, particular religious uh, beliefs or revelations um, can be resources here for for trying to refocus attention on truth and the search for truth and and then discourse. Well, I think uh, to accept that religious faith is a permanent aspect of the human psyche is a beginning. The content of that faith is going to vary and the implications of that faith socially are also going to be different. Um, uh, but that the idea of a human, humankind without religion is, 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 uh, is delusional. What happens is if certain religions disappear, other forms of meaning, which will add rituals, which will add saints, which will add uh, meaning in that metaphysical sense, will take its place. And I do think you see, for example, in the way in which wokeness, broadly speaking, has captured the upper middle classes in the way that Christianity captured many of the upper middle classes at the end of the Roman Empire, uh, or in the, uh, in the early days of the Republic, uh, in the late days of the Republic. Uh, I think it's quite striking. Similarly, I, I think the collapse of actual Christianity in American evangelicalism, or its collapse into a kind of politicized identity, cultural identity, which has little to do with the uh, transcendent divinity uh, is also a function of that. So they create literally an idol, golden calf, a, a person, this person Trump, who represents a kind of cult in which all that's necessary is to divine his views and then apply them across, uh, across your own uh, mental landscape and among your peers. These are religious impulses that want certainty, that are engaged in moral crusades and that regard themselves as morally superior. Um, well, I sometimes joke that Harvard is now returning to its roots as a divinity school uh, in which it is uh, now teaching the elites the religion that it wants the future elites to run the way Puritans used to do it uh, with uh, with, with, with extreme Protestants. Um, uh, and that again is also very, very, very familiar and very conducive. And religion itself, of course, in the founders view was a rather dry and slightly limited sense of what the divinity and, and transcendence could mean. Uh, so uh, I don't think we have to, uh, abandon a uh, profound religious belief, but I think we also have to temper it with membership in a pluralistic society. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask about your, your recommendation, um, uh, about your hope that maybe youth, <laughs> youth rebellion, um, which I might, might rephrase as youth energy as curiosity and, and uh, want, wanting to question. Uh, so uh, you must know of this, this national organization in higher education, Heterodox Academy, that theme of heterodoxy. So could you talk about your, a little bit more about your recommendations for how from within 
a university setting from within an ident an intellectual identification a little bit more to the left or a little bit more to the right, how we can make arguments to our own side of the intellectual <laughs> or political spectrum uh, don't don't ta don't go down the temptation path of power of shutting down discourse meaning of demonizing the, those who hold the other view uh, and and you know similarly on the on those on the left how to make arguments to folks toward the left why value uh, how how to help others to see the value of heterodoxy, disagreement, discourse, fa fallibilism that you were just talking about, right? Not, not full skepticism, but, but fallibilism. Yeah, well, you know, in the universities at this point, I understand why it's really hard because they, they've rigged it. Um, because, I mean, when I was, when I was at Harvard uh, or at Oxford where, you know, here I am a non-lefty in both those places, um, I was treated with a uh, kind of curious condescension uh, how is this person this intelligent and not a full-on liberal? It's like that kind of attitude. Now I've never heard of that, and I've never heard of that, Andrew. Andrew so just go ahead. Supremacy, yeah. who's busy oppressing every other person on campus. So it's changed. Obviously, the atmosphere has changed uh, in ways that I find deeply disturbing. And I don't think, to be honest, I could function on a campus. Most many campuses, certainly elite campuses, as they now exist. But again, the key thing here is the First Amendment. And we don't, we can retreat from some areas and build institutions outside of them that do this. And those institutions outside of those rather totalitarian centers of conformity are going to become attractive. Look, I, I, from my point of view, I have a simple example. And this is working in mainstream media that at some point in the last few years, most elite media decided that they would become uh, indistinguishable from the faculties of most elite universities and impose an orthodoxy and demonize and stigmatize dissent and march lockstep in favor of a social justice revolution. And people like me who remained, sort of, I'm certainly not far right, but definitely quizzical and not in any way indebted to the left, in fact, deeply skeptical of the left for a very long time, I couldn't be tolerated. They couldn't even tolerate running a column. There were staffers at that magazine that said, simply having me on the website, even though I didn't go into the office, I didn't have, I live 205 miles away from the center of New York Magazine in Washington, D.C. I nonetheless, my very existence in the site became a cause for a hostile work environment for other writers who went not to the editor, but to HR to seek to get rid of this person who was threatening them and oppressing them and making them feel afraid because I was tapping on a typewriter or on a laptop 200 miles away. Uh, so what do I do? I create my own thing, Substack. And in fact, many other places, have, have, have many other writers who could not be fit into that model have also started that. And guess what? It's incredibly popular. It's really successful. Joe Rogan has 11 million people listening to his podcast. CNN has 500,000. So the idea that these old institutions, I believe we should fight for them and within them, but that must take place alongside a sort of guerrilla campaign outside. And my basic reassurance on this is that it's more interesting to hear a variety of views than to be constantly subjected to the same unbelievably tedious orthodoxy. So when I look at the New York Times op-ed page, I know there will be nothing on it that will disagree with their line. Maybe ever occasionally a little token, something or other. Um, on my website, not to, not to brag about the weekly dish, but we every week publish dissents, really tough dissents that tell me I'm full of whatever. And I have to respond. In my podcast, I'm interviewing people I agree with and people I disagree with. 
And the reason for that is simply it is less boring. It is more fun. It is more interesting. It helps you make better uh, mental connections. It helps you think through your own ideas by listening to two different people battle it out or share or hash out certain topics. This is what media does. When you break up orthodoxy, people are interested. I don't brag again, but when I was at the New Republic and insisted on having a much more wider, much wider variety of viewpoints than was traditionally in the case, we went to the highest circulation we've ever had. Uh, it's almost twice what it is today, now that it's a sort of boring neo-Stalinist uh, propaganda sheet. Um, of course, it, it was in the 30s as well, but maybe it's returning to its roots. But uh, my hope is that, in fact, orthodoxy of this kind, especially self-righteous, moralizing orthodoxy, in the end, bores people to death. And as long as we have a First Amendment and are not subjected to something like Putin's rule, then we should be confident in the attraction of liberal ideas. Thank you. So now we are going to turn to uh, questions from the audience. There's a microphone here for those in the room. Uh, and uh, Marcia, our communications director, is there. A Andrew, while people are coming up to the microphone, just a, a few quick responses. On the theme of the interest and energy that can come from debate, our, our uh, keynote ad address uh, tonight is, uh, in effect, a, a dialogue uh, event. So we have Camille Foster speaking on questions of, of, you know, race, the debates about race and justice in America, and then we have Karen Atia from the um, uh, that's Washington gonna be, Post as a... That yeah. is going to be so much fun. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Camille is a fantastic person and so bright. And yes, I think that's crucial. It's crucial that in resisting wokeness, we don't mimic it. We don't stop policing liberal ideas <laughs> that we don't, which is why I'm concerned about these bills and laws going through various state legislatures, attempting to ban ideas uh, in universities and in colleges and in, in schools. Now, look, in secondary education, we also, we, it's not a First Amendment question. We have to determine what's in a curriculum. But from there on afterwards, I think we should not in any way ban ideas or discussions. We should challenge them. And that means we may not win in the short term, but it means we have the roots and foundations for winning in the long term. Uh, and I don't want us engaging in the defense of liberalism to become illiberal, because <laughs> it's a huge temptation. And, and that, you know, when you look at the abyss, it stares right back at you become what you are opposing, and that is a constant, again, it's very much a liberal idea that we need to resist this. Because it's a liberal idea, well, to echo socialism, but that, that we ourselves are divided between good and evil. Hmm. Um, and, that, and, and that the maximal exposure to the possibility of our error is always a good thing. Good, so again, the microphone is open. Whoever wants to ask the first question, I just have a couple other uh, comments, Michael, or uh, so Andrew, that, um, we, we are, our school, the existence of our department is something of an intellectual diversity initiative from the Arizona State Government and the leadership of Arizona State University. And then just a third uh, quick point, since you mentioned Michael Oakshot, uh, very important for you and you're, you're a scholar, Michael Oakshot. We have a visiting scholars program and so we have Timothy Fuller uh, from Colorado College coming next year, a great uh, American scholar of, of Michael Oakeshott, a friend of there's Michael no, There's no greater scholar of Oakeshott. So we have, we have Tim Fuller coming uh, next year as a visiting scholar. So, That's fantastic. Yeah. He's, he's, not only is he, is he know Oakeshott better than Oakeshott in, in some respect, um, he's also just a lovely person. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we have, the, we have the first, uh, first person up at the microphone. So a brief, brief question, please. Thank you. If you had unlimited resources and a magic wand, what, cha what changes would you make on university campuses and American society so that we can have our individual rights but still get along? I, I think reiterating universities, a core attachment to freedom of speech, to the inviolability of tenure, to the eradication of kangaroo courts, 
uh, in which people are accused of sins, essentially, and have to prove themselves innocent. Uh, I think ending those measures is is a critical part. There are, you know, I think there's a, I'm, I'm, try, I'm blanking right now, but there are, uh, there are a, a, a charter of, of rights that you can endorse as a university that protect free speech. Um, right. Might be the Chicago, the, is that, is that, you think yeah, the Chicago what, principles? That's what I'm yeah. referring to, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but I also think that the, for example, the eradication of due process in things like Title IX investigations, which are just a, an invitation to illiberalism, uh, need to be undone as well, as they were under the last administration. Thank you. Next, next question. Hi, my name is Terence. And as young Americans and even immigrants, how do we advocate for free speech and liberty? In other words, how do we be like Joe Rogan and even you? How do, where do we start? You start in a way, in a greater position than many other younger generations have started because previous generations always had these institutions and these gatekeepers that were very hard to get past. Now you have, you can sit in front of your screen on your laptop and launch a YouTube channel and express your ideas, advance them freely and gain a following. I look at someone like uh, this extraordinary young man called Coleman Hughes who really came out of absolutely nowhere, but did so on his own accord through YouTube uh, and now uh, through Substack. And overnight, he's a, he's a media sensation. He's, he just went on Joe Rogan, actually. Or Rogan himself. Now look, let's not idealize Rogan. He's a, he's a flawed person. He gets things wrong. He's entertained some kooks. But the spirit of Rogan, let's think about this. Let's talk about this. Really? It's so much more in tune with the general culture of American curiosity than these pious bromides from these self-righteous elites. Uh, and trust that. People are interested. Lots of people are staying quiet out of fear, not conviction. I think the one thing we can do to defend liberal democracy is just practice it. Practice it. Make yourself read the most powerful arguments against your position. Have conversations with people with whom you disagree. You know, bring a, bo a bottle of bourbon or a couple of joints with you when you do so that humans can relax and undo. I think begin to restore the possibility, and I, I hate to say this because I'm sitting virtually here, but of talking face to face. It's amazing. People will not say, will say online things about people. They would never dream of saying to their face. So cutting down a little bit on some virtual interaction, reestablishing forum where we can have this kind of debate, establishing institutions like yours, which in which, which insist upon heterodoxy. This shows up the intolerant left as intolerant. I also think you just have to engage in the arguments. One of the, the key moves in this is that you, some, someone left workers will say something, you will say, well, I don't agree with that. And they will say, well, that's because you're white or male or whatever. And then you're, you're kind of stuck. It's a kind of Kafka trap. Uh, well, you just have to say that's simply a logical fallacy. Um, what are you really trying to say? What do you mean systems of oppression? What do you mean by white supremacy? What are the intellectual origins of these ideas? tracing them back to sort of uh, post-war neo-Marxist uh, post-structuralism. Um, and I think understanding those arguments and then engaging those arguments as they are, most people won't believe them, is important. There's a lot of moral intimidation going on. 
And the key thing is, however hard it is, not to be morally intimidated. The point of cancellation, as it were, is, is to intimidate others. What happened to me in beginning five from New York Magazine for no reason that I wouldn't toe the line uh, is, has not really hurt me. By going to Substack, I've made much more money and I have roughly the same reach. But what it was designed to do is tell anyone like you, don't you dare. This is gonna happen to you. You'll be stigmatized. We'll use social media to render you a non-person. Uh, and I think the only way around the actions of that kind of bullying is to stand up to it, confront it, be fearless, and watch people who watch this interaction gain some courage. Um, you know, in some ways you can say this is a terrible time to be a public intellectual. On the other side, you could say, this is an important time to be an independent public intellectual, to be an independent writer, because it matters now in ways it probably didn't matter quite as much, say, 30 years ago, because we are in a civilizational moment in the West in which the foundations of the West are being challenged from within. What greater moment to get out there and mix up the arguments? What greater opportunity to get stuck in? It won't be fun a lot of the time. It will be a little arduous. When I think of the people I admire the most in writing in the last century or so, I think of Orwell, who was despised by the left and mocked by the right, who, who towards the end of his life couldn't get a publisher for 1984, was regarded as disloyal to the, to the country by attacking uh, an ally of the Soviet Union. Uh, and or someone like Raymond Aron, who in the fervor of the 60s left in France, didn't budge, nor did he become a reactionary. He stuck it out in the middle. Uh, those are the models. They, 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 when you look through history, you see them rise above the, uh, the tree line, because you see, they didn't mind being alone. And in fact, part of the excellence of their writing comes from this sense of beleaguerment and this willingness to go against the grain. Thank you, Andrew. Just before the next question for our, our question and others in the audience, I wanted to let you know that the school um, is trying to support a student organization here on the ASU campus, which is a, a chapter of a national university student organization called Bridge USA and the, the chapter here is Bridge ASU and they're having a they're having a student debate dialogue event in April so you should look for um, information on that and Andrew they are partnering the, the Bridge uh, ASU chapter USA chapter here is uh, partnering with Braver Angels a national organization that started with the name uh, Better Angels Lincoln's um, phrase from his first inaugural find the better angels of our nature, uh, now, now uh, braver angels. And so the, that national group is partnering with the, the Bridge USA chapter here for that um, April event. And our school is trying to help support that activity. So, okay, thank you. Next question. Thank you, sir. Um, the question I have for you, sir, is how did we get here in the first place? In particular, for you has to do with the preceding, what I would argue, would be a hyper-individualistic phase, whereby we have steadily dismantled all of the outgroups within our society. You know, there's the decline of nationalism, the religion, sex, and race, and locality-based exclusion and inclusionary groups within our society, alongside the collapse of the Union to provide the Soviet Union to provide that additional outgroup. So, is it not perhaps the collapse of these outgroups within our society that is now causing them to return in such forces because there is that void? Or do you think it's really is the decline of Christianity that is the real cause of it all? No, I think, I think you're right that, 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 that Western capitalism, this is a challenge for the right, has undermined what one might call benign tribalism. A benign tribalism you could see of as Edmund Burke's little platoons of society, your local associations, a pride in 
a football team, uh, pride in uh, uh, a church that you belong to, you know, this strange habit in America that if someone on a stage mentions a state, the five people who are come from that state in the audience have to whoop and cheer, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, the foreigner when he first came, he was like, oh, really? Just every, every time you mention a state, they have to get up and cheer their own. But that's a benign kind of tribalism. And I think also nationalism itself is a benign kind of tribalism as long as it is not taken to its extreme because we all have to belong somewhere. Um, the key is what kind of associations we need to do. And we do need to foster things like neighborhood groups, church groups, sporting leagues, VFWs, uh, all the connective tissue that help uh, push back against the atomizing dangerous aspects of individualism. But this then becomes a challenge for the right, which is, which would, which the right is grappling with. This is that to what extent has capitalism itself atomized society and led the way for it to be, for the, these group identities to appear to be meaningful. Um, and that's a challenge. And, you know, it's not a new one. I mean, you can go back and read Daniel Bell's The Cultural Contradiction of Capitalism to see this quite vividly. Uh, but, and so I do think a renegotiation of, for example, unfettered free trade, of unfettered free markets, in a sense that it might be destroying core social capital and also eviscerating human meaning is important. Um, and I do think that conservatism as a whole needs to rethink its relationship with what you might call neoliberalism and neoliberal economics, as is happening across Western Europe and indeed in some way distorted by this clown tyrant uh, in, on the American right as well. Thank you, and it's a very Tocquevillian response, I, if I do say so, which I think will win you a lot of support from the department. <laughs> well, you know, I was taught by Harvey, uh, you, uh, you certainly absorb your Tocquevillianism uh, from him, but also, you know, the truth is, I, I, my first encounter with Tocqueville was at Oxford, where I, I was reading the Ancien Regime, uh, which for Europeans is, 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 a, is a more important text than, than democracy in America. But uh, I think his understanding of the promise and pitfalls of individualism remain absolutely valid. Um, uh, and again, I would say, how do we, well, we need to do it ourselves. Form your own groups, reach out to other people. Um, definitely argue with your relatives at Thanksgiving. Definitely stop avoiding the topics and have at it. Um, and the other element I think in all of this is, is humor and comedy. The, the, the greatest threat to these pious orthodoxies is mockery. And good Lord, are they giving us plenty to mock. The one thing I recommend that anybody does who's interested in contemporary culture and wants to see one way of tackling this in a way that's culturally very subversive and significant is uh, if you've stopped watching South Park, go back and watch it. Uh, the last couple of seasons, uh, the continuing coverage, it is brilliant. I, if you really want to see the woke left, uh, as well as kind of the loony right, deeply undermined and mocked, uh, Matt Stone and Trey Parker are the geniuses of our time. Similarly, uh, Chappelle, Louis C.K., these great comics who are targeted now because orthodox uh, characters understand, have always understood that the, the most effective weapon against them is humor. I'm reminded also of Orwell's when he was asked, so why has Britain never had a fascism? Why did they not succumb to fascism in the 30s? And Orwell remarked that, excuse me, that the one reason the English never succumbed to fascism is if a bunch of troops goose-stepped down the streets of London, people would giggle. There's a, <laughs> there, it would look like John Cleese. And, and at some level, <laughs> that's also a, a sort of form of cultural resistance. 
to illiberalism. Um, it's deeper in England, to be honest with you. America is a very different place. Uh, it's not, it's a place where humor is, 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 is more rooted in ethnicity than in national sensibility. Um, but it's important. And when you see these people try to stamp humor out, be aware that they're more alert to the danger of humor than some of the humorists are. So go keep at it, keep at it. Thank you. Um, it's great. Monty Python and the silly walk as pillars of classical liberalism and liberty. I have to think that's <laughs> true. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have time for one last question. You, you have roused Camille Foster from his seat, and he is at the microphone to, to ask a question. I like when people refer to me by my full name, considering there's only one man named Camille I've ever met. Um, Andrew, thank you very much for um, the very kind words and for over-promising about this evening. I, I assure you it'll, it'll be kind of exciting. I don't know if it'll be as exciting as Andrew has suggested, but I'll try. Um, but I did want to um, ask a question, perhaps push back a little bit, but first agree um, vehemently with the idea that like ridicule is a weapon. And perhaps I'll ask two quick questions, not necessarily related, but first, ridicule is a weapon, but overstating the danger of your opponents is something that I am gravely concerned about. Um, I think people who are advocating for a post-liberal epoch, for banning critical race theory in various contexts, often talk about this as this grave existential threat where they control the terrain and we have no hope of victory, thus, jettison your values, what use is holding on to those? They weaken you. And if you're not willing to fight with all you have and to do anything to murder these people, then you know, you're, you're bound to lose. Um, it, it seems to me if we know that jokes could possibly disarm them, if we know that, to, to borrow a phrase from myself, being brave and calling bullshit is an effective strategy in your workplace and on your campus, I think it would be who of us to be very cautious about the way that we talk about the, the concerns that we have. And uh, relatedly, I, I'm wondering about the kind of characterization in response to the question of how did we get here? Um, I think a lot about the kind of complacency that is associated with victory and the fact that when we're having a conversation about liberal ideals, we're having it across generations. And it is different people that are having these conversations. And in many instances, the people who we sort of drug along through the civil rights epoch, who by meiosis, um, uh, 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 mitosis, have adopted certain values without ever really understanding them, without being able to articulate them. There is, there's a sense in which we've always assumed that we all agreed on the value of certain things but we've never actually talked about it in some respects. We just presumed it. And I think that the, the weird jujitsu where we've moved from equality to equity is something that makes many people uncomfortable for reasons they can't articulate. And I don't know if that's fundamentally about a lack of kind of Christian um, affiliation or a, or a hyper individualistic society or markets doing too much. It seems to me that the fundamental issue, considering all those things have existed for a very long time and could likely exist alongside various other sets of values, is a fundamental underappreciation for the degree to which there is a forever war and a need to constantly articulate, reimagine, and expand on certain ideas and ideals and values that we hold dear. If you care about this, you have to talk about it frequently, even when it seems like you've already won. And I think we stopped doing that. So I wonder if, you, if you'd respond to those things. And I look forward to seeing you in DC soon. I do too, Camille, thank you so much. Um, you're, I, I'm with you, basically. Um, uh, as I said, I, I, I'm alarmed, deeply alarmed by the idea that something like critical race theory or indeed uh, queer theory or gender theory can be introduced uh, and planted in the minds of three or four year olds which is what's basically happening now across our educational system. And I do think that's important to note and to argue against. But banning these things, using the power of the state against ideas is, is a step that fatally compromises our position. 
which is why I've taken a stand against them, even though, of course, as we know on Twitter, no one will give you credit for saying that. But no, I do. And I, uh, now I do think that in some ways, you know, things like uh, curriculum in elementary schools is subject to democratic debate and decision. And if something is being foisted on these curriculums that no one really approved of and the parents are unaware of, then it's not illiberal to say what the hell's going on here. Why, what are you teaching our kids? Um, that's, that's completely salient. But when the political branches get in and start dictating uh, this, then I think we're in, in very dangerous uh, ground. Um, so I agree with you with that, on that. The second, um, the second point is yes, we, especially after victory in the Cold War, took liberalism for granted. And it turns out you can't, you have to keep educating people about it. I grew up in the Cold War. It was quite clear to me why liberal democracy was superior. And I had to make all those arguments as a teenager. Uh, I had to read Solzhenitsyn. I read Orwell. I read uh, the, the liberal texts. I, I, I wrestled with things because the Cold War kind of forced you to. But since we won and everywhere is, 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 it seemed temporarily to be uh, a festival of liberalism, which we're now finding out to be untrue, of course, in places like Russia, uh, enabled, allowed us to just forget it and not to keep reiterating this eternal conflict. You're right, it is an eternal conflict. It's a forever war. Um, there is no permanent victory. There's no permanent defeat in this. There are some institutional advantages that we can counter and we can organize against. But uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Camille. But I, at the same time, I don't want to be complacent about the power of these ideas and the way in which they have been imposed, especially in public secondary education, in ways that are undemocratic and somewhat disturbing in the radicalism of their claims. Andrew, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Andrew Sullivan for joining us for this keynote. <laughs>